So we come to the last part of the Greek philosophies. Last Greek philosophies part two, <laughs> happily named again. But after this, this would be the last of, last of Greek philosophies, and this is the last time that Greek philosophy would ever, ever, ever be advanced. Of course, hooray or too bad, whichever one your reaction is. So let's get onto it. So Epicureanism is the third most influential Hellenistic Greek philosophy. Let's see, we stopped at skepticism last time, and what Epicureanism does is that it, it took the parts of skepticism, which was good, but it didn't go to the part where it says it doubted everything. It was another religion for populace, it was slightly more intellectual. So Epicurus was the person who advanced this uh, <laughs> after the name Epicureanism. So Epicurus has been a character of really genial and kind people. He's been said that he was really good to his friends and when he died, he wrote a letter to his wife explaining that he should take care of one of his disciples' child. He was a really friendly person. He wrote a lot of letters, he had lots of friendships, he made lots of acquaintances, but he was really aggressive and offensive to the contemporary philosophers. He treated them with scorn and he thought, he didn't think that he was better than them, but he simply thought that philosophies at that time deserved to be treated with scorn, that they weren't simply worthy of being philosophers, which in a sense they weren't. So Epicureanism basically pursues pleasure. Well, when you say it pursues pleasure, you really have a hedonistic view of things. You you see people drinking alcohol all the time, having uh being having really illicit relationships, doing whatever you want, going to jail for whatever you want. But that's not really the view that Epicureans preferred. So according to them, there were active or dynamic goods and passive and stat static goods. Basically, what they were was that they were stages of goods in which they were. For example, let's say love, right? Love is an active good. When you and when you're in love, it feels really good. But when you break up, you get shattered, you get broken, and you can never live anymore. I'm not speaking from personal experience, but whatever. Anyways, passive and static goods are goods, but they're not. They're more like making up the pain that the body goes through. For example, hunger, right? When you eat food, when you don't, when you overeat a feast, it feels good, right? That's an active pleasure. But if you just eat a simple loaf of bread, if you just do a simple thing to keep your desires and fears and wants at bay, that's a passive good. And for Epicureanism, this achieved tranquility. For them, they didn't need anything else after getting rid of the bad, the um, bad and the evil and the offensive. All they had was pleasure and that was good for them. Basically, it, it's more like a nat stat of zero. If it's 10, then it's capricious. It can fluctuate down from negative 10 to 10 at any time. So what they did was that they simply put it at zero and put that as pleasure because it's the absence of pain. Epicureanists pursued their own pleasure, which is kind of like utilitarianists, which would go in in the 17th century, but Epicurus really said that everyone should pursue their own pleasure. To him, he theoretically said that everything was just a means to an end, which was, of course, his own pleasure. However, like other philosophers who pursued the same things, he was blind to this by his morals. For friendship, he says that they are absolutely needed and they are all the time good, even though friendship could be considered an active good. So. Even though he preached that people shouldn't have any active goods, or even if they did, they should limit it to the minimum, he really, really, really liked and loved his friends. And that was one of the problems with Epicurus, is that one of them is inconsistent. For him, he didn't like the sciences. Like previous philosophers, um, not Plato and Aristotle, but skeptics and other philosophers, Science was simply a way of explaining things. Skeptics didn't like philosophy because they said that it was unprovable, because as we stated before, Deductive logic has to start somewhere, and that's unacceptable because it can't start anywhere without observing everything in the world. But for Epicureans, they just looked at pleasure and said, it's this pleasurable to me. If it is, then it's good. If it's not, then it's pointless. And Epicurus said that science was pointless because it was simply a way of explaining things that could be explained otherwise. Look at lightning or bad weather, right? Who cares if it's a bunch of atoms grouped together that's forming phenomenons, or if it's just God causing things because they're angry. Either way, it's just an explanation, right? It's not like you could do anything to change the mind of God or to change the rules of nature. So for Epicureanists, classical Epicureanists, science was simply a way of explaining things that may be more logical for others, but pointless at the end because it doesn't really mean anything. Also, Epicureanists didn't really like religion. Now, if you pursue pleasure, then you might view religion as something good because religion sets you apart from the fear of not living in hell constantly. But Epicurus took a slightly different view. He said that religion was the cause of everything. Nietzsche mentions this later too, but he says that us as human beings are a natural pursuer of happiness. And we've always been like that until religion came to be. Religion asked us what was after death and that if you don't believe in religion, you would suffer in hell. Does 
hell. This is especially true for Christianity, but other religions mention this as well. There's always a heaven and a hell, and you have to choose between them, and the obvious choice is heaven. So anyways, he said that religion was being used as a stick of fear to install people. And he said that religion is simply a freeing from its own chains, because religion creates those fears, which it says to free from, but people can never be free from that. And he hated religion passionately, like how people now, how religion now hate those Epicureans. So the next influential philosophy was Stoicism. Now, stoic means, right now, it means someone not really caring about emotions or worldly things or anything like that. It was close, but it was slightly different. The most, the founder of stoicism is Zeno. You probably heard about him from Zeno's paradoxes. And yeah, he's a pretty good mathematician, but he founded stoicism as well. So what stoicism does is that it took the platonic Socrates as the model. We talked about this before, but the platonic Socrates was really, really, really stoic he didn't care about emotions he didn't care about cold or heat or what he was wearing what he was doing he didn't care about the body's pleasures so they took scott socrates and then he said this is the perfect model a person that doesn't care about any worldly things and cares only about the pursuit of knowledge so stoicists were materialists basically materialists not in the way that they only care about material things but they believe that everything in the world is made out of materialists there's a conversation between zeno and a skeptic a skeptic asks then how can you ever know anything? What about virtues and morals? And Zeno replied, they're all solid. They're solid as this table, which I'm writing this on, or this computer, which you will be watching it on. And what he said, when the skeptic replied, what about ideas and knowledge and all this kind of stuff? And Zeno said, they are all solid. Zeno had a really hatred for ant metaphysics, which led him to anti-metaphysics too quickly. He didn't even want to consider the idea that there was something else besides the materialistic world, which is slightly illogical, but he got to the conclusion that only materialistic things existed. Stoics are in the later part of Greek philosophy. It reconciles the best and is most compatible with religions and especially Christianity. They believed in the God, but they didn't really call him God in the Christian model, but they simply called him the one or Zeus or sometimes even the being, right? And they said that everything had fate, that everything was predetermined from the start and that we can only live by fate. So whatever happens to us and we grieve over it is pointless. Why should we grieve when someone dies or someone we love breaks up or whatever happens? It was meant to happen. What's the point of grieving over it when it's meant to happen and you can just go on living without changing consequences. Of course, if you can, you should try, but the point was that everything was predetermined. There's no point grieving over something that can't be fixed. Of course, the problem was this. Stoicism pursued virtue. They said the good, right? And now this is a problem because the good can't exist with fate. If there's fate, then everything was caused to me, everything was predetermined from the beginning, right? There's no real external factors, external as in outside of fate, that influences my decisions or virtues or any thoughts, anything I have. And that's a problem because for the definition of virtue, what virtue must be is, is that it must be good. It must be a course of action taken that must be above other courses of action. And the problem is that if we allow virtue and determinism at the same time, then virtue becomes meaningless. If I was meant to do this, how can you say that this is more virtuous than something else? Okay, let's look at an extreme example, Hitler, right? If Hitler was meant to kill millions of Jews, how is that less virtuous than, let's say, not killing them? He was meant to do it, right? So there can't be any real virtue and stuff. So in the same way, benevolence, showing goodwill to others through virtue, is, again, pointless. If you say you must show goodwill, you can't really show goodwill because goodwill can't exist the same way virtue can of course, some Stoicists tried to defend this by talking about the elements. They said that the soul and the body are different things. That when body is made out of clay, it may influence the soul to do decisions. But when there's decisions that influence the body, that influence the soul that's made by the body, that is not a good. But then if you resist it, if you take the idea of a soul, which is immortal and derived, is derived from God, and you do good, that's the virtue and benevolence. That all crumbles when you talk, think about contemporary society. Let's say mind altering drugs, right? Or extreme torture that causes you to do stuff. That's body that changes the spirit sometimes permanently if we brainwash them or if we use really dangerous drugs. And what that does is that it completely twists us. If the body influences the mind too much, that means that there can't be a dichotomy, which is a differentiator between the mind and the body. So at that point, it all falls apart. But for, the, for now, stoicism was widely accepted because it said that everything was meant to happen, but if you do good, it's good. So it's just, again, appealing to popular ideas.
So the later Stoics rejected materialism because <clears throat> talking about the elements and virtue and fate earlier, it all comes down to paradox, right? So well, they more talked about the platonic elements. And then the idea concept of souls, eternal souls came in. <clears throat> And said that souls were from the world of ideals and other stuff derived from Plato, of course. And they said that the pursuit of good was the pursuit of ideal and the pursuit of absolute in the Platonic world of ideals and ideas and forms. And this also, people will really accepted this readily as well because they didn't really understand the philosophical elements. They were more deterrent, they were more concerned with fate and benevolence and whatnot. Anyways, this was a logical, this was supposed to be a logical proof that was supposed to prove that fate and virtue can go together. But again, the problem is that fate determines everything, even those in the ideal world. And there are, of course, criticisms of Plato that was made earlier. Marcus Aurelius was a Stoicist. He was a very famous Roman emperor. I think you know him better, better as Mark Antony. Anyways, so he was a Stoicist, and what he did was that he wrote meditations on the subjects about what he thought Stoicism was. And he, he tries to explain this idea of Stoicism. It runs into problems like, every stoicist does but then he did he so he is a prominent figure in stoicism so the thing is after <clears throat> alexander conquered alexander macedon conquered greece it was conquered again and this time by the roman empire now if you compare the greek culture and roman culture roman culture is definitely inferior to greek culture they had worse technology they had worse ideas humanities arts mathematics whatever the only thing they were really superior in was military and collectivism as a society so what happened when the Romans took over Greece was that it basically whipped out any last Greek surviving philosophy. There was one last philosopher, we'll cover him after, right after this slide, but at the end it killed really what was classical Greek philosophy. So Roman Empire, the influence on Greek philosophy could be seen as destruction at worst and cessation at best. Even if it didn't completely destroy the spirits and the ideas of Greek philosophy, it did seize all activities of classical Greek philosophy. And yeah, the taking part of Romans could be seen as the death of Greece. <clears throat> Basically, the Greek city-states had two codes in which they lived. First, it was freedom. Freedom as a city-state. Athena was free from Sparta. They had a collective identity of Greece, but they were all free from each other and they had individual freedom. But then there were also continual conflicts, not within each other in the state, but within states. For example, Spartan and Athena and the Peloponnesian War. Peloponnesian War. That was a conflict that was really big, and people liked that. That was anarchy. But Rome, when it took over, installed peace. Now this time may sound good, but what that means is that you just trade adventure for what peace is. When you have excitement and changes and, and things in life, you just trade it for tranquility and nothingness. And that's reflected in the philosophy as well. The religions, of course, as mentioned earlier from Alexander, right? But there's also a Roman Empire which took the religions of the places it conquered and it spread itself through the empire, so that replaced most of the philosophy as well. The, when the Roman Empire fell, that was really the end of any classical Greek philosophy, and any philosophy in general, until the Scotists, the religious philosophers from, the, from then on, took over. So one last, absolutely lost philosophy is Neoplatonism. The person who advocated this is Platonus, which, who lived from 204 to 270 AD. You can see that he differed a lot from Pla 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 the original Plato, who lived around 300 BC. So he wrote a lot after his time, and he advanced, he somewhat advanced the idea of Plato. So Platonus isn't really that great of a philosopher. He's not that famous. Neoplatonism is accepted in current society, true, but it doesn't have that much impact. But what we have to understand about philosophers is that we can't just understand philosophy because it's good logic. Philosophy could be appreciated in one of those two ways. One, if there's circumstances and those conditions are shown in the philosophy. For example, Epicureanism and Stoicism are not that great of a philosophy because the elements of, pe elements of peacefulness and laziness and unpurposeful unintelligibleness is in reflected in the philosophies. But what we can see is that Platonus took the circumstances and then he tried to change it. He was the last philosopher that viewed things in a hopeful way. All the other philosophies were more in a passive way. And you can also appreciate it by the beauty of the logic, even if it doesn't make sense. For example, if you say Dao's take if you take Dao's idea and you say everything's made out of water, it's illogical. Of course it's not made out of water. But if you understand the style processes, as I explained it, you can understand the beauty of the logic and that's why it explains it. And for Pl Platonus, both things apply. Platonus was the first one to come up with the concept of Trinity, not in Christianity Trinity, but he did influence Christians a lot. He said that there's God, 
and then there's and then there's the idea of the nose, which is translated roughly as the spirit, but it has a connotation of intelligence that's not really reflecting the spirit. And then there's the one. So what he said about nos is really interesting. Socrates once said that one should look inside in their virtue to pursue the greatest good because there's a greatest good and God that lives once inside of us. And Platonus took this view and then took and shaped it a little differently. He didn't say that there was a God inside of us, but he said that we have to look inside for nos for spirit. Basically, nos are like the unconscious mind model that's famous in 20th century philosophy, but instead of being irrational and driven by desires, it was driven by intelligence and reason. So the bad thing was that the soul and the matter and the world was, he tried to explain those things and that was the bad thing. He said that the soul existed and then everything in the made out of matter and then the soul was an image that came into soul because it wanted to, not because of a specific reason of that. So in fact, this influenced the Christian philosophies a lot. You can even say Thomas Aquinas, who liked Aristotle, followed Platonus than really the true Aristotle or Plato. But what we see is that because of this, the next philosophers for the next 900 years or so takes this idea only. They think the soul and the matter in the world is the only thing that matters, and they try to expand upon the spew and don't go into any other subjects. But the good thing was that he tried to defend the world of ideals. He was the last philosopher in this age to advocate the world of ide theory and ideas of forms that were refuted by Aristotle, and he tried to reinstall them again by saying that the and world of ideals exist. They're heaven, they're religion. Now, combining it with Christianity or any other religion with philosophy is not really ideal for a log truly logical philosophical standing, but he did try to defend them, and we could say he somewhat succeeded by saying that there is a world outside of us. Also, he was the last, again, he was the last philosopher who viewed things in a hopeful way. He said that things could change and that there's ideals that we should also perform. Platonus is the alpha, the beginning, and the omega of Greek philosophy. Why he is he the beginning is because he influenced the scholars. He influenced the religion theologians that came after him for, as I said, about 900 plus years. But he also reflects the true end of classical Greek philosophy. After this, no matter how smart you are, no matter how intelligent you are, you are never in the system of the Greeks. You are always the Renaissance or, or modernist or contemporary philosophy. Platonus represents the absolute end of classical Greek philosophy as you know it. After Neoplatonism, we go into more intricate systems and more complicated systems of what is good and what is bad, or and what all those questions later on. But so in the way, here's the start at the end. And that is the conclusion of classical Greek philosophy.